Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful post Thanksgiving entry into the winter season. Got plenty of snow here finally, but by the end of the week, it shall be gone. Oh. And this too shall pass. This is John Barnwell here. I'm in. The Motor City and the U.S. of A. I'm here with the Reverend David William Perry in the city of London and merry old England. And this is our 65th episode of What is Truth, where we attempt to try and improve our questions, not presuming that we have all the answers. And that absence of finality is what leaves the possibility of fulfillment. And so that is something to take to heart. And that's, I've been humbled on more than one occasion when I thought I had things figured out. Uh, today, I'd like to explore at least a little bit. I've posted below uh, the video on the respective sites, YouTube and FB, uh, links to Rudolf Steiner lectures that are pertaining to some questions that have come up of recent time. And uh, they all seem to somehow, it's interesting that people ask questions coming from a completely different perspective. And yet the, the way to look at it is uh, a similar path to other questions that I've gotten uh, since our last podcast. So that's it's kind of funny serendipity, shall we say. And uh, I guess where I could begin with this is, is when you get into the f first 14 verses of St. John, he gives you a very concise description of the mystery of the Logos, the sixth mystery. And that's the, you could call it the gospel of the eagle is, is how it's portrayed in the great cathedrals of Europe where they show the eagle with St. John the bull with Luke and the simple shepherds. And then you have the angel and the angel is pertaining to the gospel of Matthew. It's an angel or a man type figure upright. And then you have the gospel of Mark, which is the lion. And they all have very, very important perspectives upon the mission of Jesus Christ and so that they all have to be taken to heart. And if you just get too deep into one, you might miss out on what the other has to offer. So that there's this whole conjoining, much like what I made reference to in, in the questions that I've received, that there's a, a conjoining of, of uh, the subject, you know, and and it's most interesting because it's in the Gospel of John. Rudolf Steiner makes the point that that is most clearly an initiation document. And so in light of that, say, well, what might that mean? And when you get into uh, first uh, understanding the uh, nature of Christianity or what it really is, you have to come to terms with the mysteries of the ancient world if you want to have a larger vista. And, and I don't ask anybody to, to accept or believe anything that I say. And I posted the links to the lectures themselves below, so just in case anybody is a, a Steiner student, and they think that I'm just making up stuff. But I try my best to not do that. But 
it's it's difficult when you're dealing with what I consider the most difficult subject. But uh, first, I'm going to say uh, hello to the Reverend David Perry in London. How are you doing there? Hi, John. It's lovely to to be with you. We don't have Thanksgiving here, so I can't say I want my Thanksgiving dinner. I want my Thanksgiving dinner, so I can't say post Thanksgiving anyway. I'm freezing my ass off. Hence, I've got my Christmas jumper on slightly early because this is the third jumper I am wearing. Um, there is snow across the country, which in this neck of the woods, even even though, of course, we're in North Europe, is actually quite unusual. Um, and it's bitterly cold in London uh, to the extent that nobody's moving at, along the streets at the minute. That means it's cold. We haven't got anything as, as beautiful as the snow. I'm sorry. I'm a big kid when it comes to that. I love the snow. I love the snow. I love the snow. Snowmen, snowballs, all the rest of it. Um, yeah, apart from freezing and my joints giving out, because that's just what they do at times like this. Yeah, wondering. Um, oh, it's strange. I mean, I've been caught up in a, a debate the last couple of days about the differences between Catholic and Protestant Bibles. Uh, for no re no reason I could really put my finger on. Um, and, of course, there are extra books, depending how you look at it. I mean, is that the original book count, or is that extra books um, in the Catholic Bible as opposed to the Protestant Bible? And I found myself, to my horror, or is it delight, I don't know, disagreeing with Calvin, um, at least on two points, so I suppose that fits in with the, the flow of my own personal life at the minute, not all the things that are happening here. Um, and, yeah, so looking forward to Christmas, although it's still too early to talk about it. It's still too early for decorations. It's still too early for everything. Wondering um, about Steiner and Anthroposophy. I find myself doing that a lot at the minute. Um, and enjoying, I don't know, just enjoying the show and where it's going, and I agree, perfecting the route to perfect questions and seeing what happens next. So that's sort of how I am. We've had our traditional Sunday uh, roast. I cooked it. I tend to cook most weekends for everybody. And feeling okay yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing fine. And uh, looking forward moving into the holiday season and the festival of Sol Invictus, according to ancient Rome, the shortest day of the year coming up, because after that, the days get longer and we get closer and closer to spring. And uh, But the winters tend to be tediously long in uh, Michigan here. This is, this is definitely a snow state. And... Uh, uh, somebody's asking, does Reverend Perry agree? Well, I don't want to get into that topic right now, but we can, we can, uh, trust me, we'll, we'll have things that are relevant. But um, where was I? Oh, yes. And so here we are with the snow and the snows. I used to uh, see this book a friend of mine had, and it was a, a book that a photographer See how wonderful this is? I had no idea I was going to be talking about this. But uh, actually, David's shirt has a, a bunch of inaccurate, his sweater has inaccurate snowflakes. Or are those stars? Are those the stars of Bethlehem? They must be, because uh, snowflakes are six-pointed stars. And of course, when you add the center, that, that's, that's seven again. And when you get into understanding uh, the mystery associated with the sixth mystery and the mystery of the Logos, it brings you to the, the, the challenge of taking the, the, the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John, where he says, uh, and all things, and nothing was made that was not made. And, and that whole idea that the, when you're talking about the, the logos, when you're talking about the Christ being, you're talking about the creator of, of this world. And that's an important point that you almost never hear 
because they tend to go back into the into the Old Testament story where God breathed life into Adam and, and that whole procession of events. But if you don't have a background in spiritual science, then you won't have a context to be able to solve the riddle, really. Uh, although uh, Johannes Scota Saragina in the fourth section of the Paraphysion got as close as anybody's gotten in uh, much of the history of philosophy. And in fact, where I have to find that reference now, I got all this things I've been working on. And uh, here it is, I think. No, excuse me for this, how impolite of me. Well, anyways. The, in the Paraphysion in the ninth century, Johannes Scotus Saragina, he wrote that text, and it's uh, it translated uh, De Divisione Naturae, or The Division of Nature, as the title was given uh, by Thomas Gale in the 1681 edition. But what Scotus Saragina, who's called by numerous names and spellings and all of that, but... Uh, it's John the Scot is, is how he's sometimes referred to because in one of his uh, manuscripts, he refers to himself as Uragina, meaning generated from, from Ireland, meaning uh, Maior, the major Ireland, which is actually Ireland and not the, the minor island, Ireland. So that when you get into that, and he was, he was uh, in the court of Charles the Bald, the, the emperor. And at that time, uh, it's after Charlemagne, that uh, Michael the Stammerer, as a gift, had, had earlier given to Charlemagne the works of Dionysius, the Iapagite, and they were, there was a kind of a rough translation made, but then uh, John the Scot who came from the, the unparalleled schools of, of Celtic Christianity that uh, get very little notice because of what was happened, what happened to them as they were in, assimilated into the Catholic Church. There was uh, a, a real struggle that went on there. I don't want to get into that today, although that is an interesting subject, and that ties into the, the difference between just a cross and a cross with a circle. The cross of the circle being that Cel Celtic cosmic Christianity. And a, the Christianity of the grail, we could call it. But in, in getting to understanding the, the distinctions, Rudolf Steiner makes the point is that people do not uh, appreciate the subtlety of, of the uh, indications given by St. John in the first 14 verses, because he, he makes reference to the Logos being the creator of everything we see here. And so how does Jehovah Elohim fit into that scheme? And, and that's the subtle distinction, because if you look back to the mysteries of, of the Father that are represented in the Old Testament and in, in the ancient pagan world, for that matter, you had uh, in, within the evolution of consciousness, it, it's a different point in history. And likewise, if you go back to the dispensations from the ancient Indian period and Stone Age India and, and the tradition that evolved out of that, you could take it all the way up to Blavatsky's secret doctrine where she really does not have uh, the inside information regarding the Christ mysteries and the mysteries of Rosicrucianism and the mysteries of the West, that, that that book totally misses the boat when it comes to Christianity. And uh, the most telling thing is that she takes uh, Christ Jesus and interprets that he is uh, actually another figure altogether, you know, and so you have... Uh, 
Yeshu ben Pendira, who was stoned to death and hung from a tree in Egypt, you know, in the centuries preceding the incarnation of Christ. So that she misses it on that one. And then there are other traditions that miss it. And like, for example, in, in uh, the Middle East, the, the opinion that there was a substitute crucifixion that, that Christ was never crucified. So there's a lot of different attempts to come to understanding uh, what happened uh, a little more than a couple thousand years ago. And so perhaps we could shed a little bit of light on, on the manner in which people try to encompass this event. And Rudolf Steiner makes the point. He says that in the ancient world, you had the ancient mysteries, and people would go through uh, an initiation. And the way in which that they found people to be initiated is the keepers of the mystery center could look at the aura of individuals and see who was right to, to be initiated. And so you were selected. You didn't like go knock on the door and say, hey, let me in. It, that wasn't the way it worked. It was that you were selected and you would be brought through an experience to where you'd go into a trance and, and you'd actually leave your body and have an experience of uh, the being that, that would come to incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth the Christ being, the Logos. and But they have different names for it in the different traditions. And, and you can also go back and look at some of the traditions and have a real difficult time trying to use Advaita Vedanta to interpret Christianity, which is like what Rene Ganam basically did. And he ended up converting to Islam. So he didn't, he didn't understand uh, the ideas that I'm trying to, or he didn't agree or whatever, however you want to interpolate it. But in, in Rudolf Steiner's work, he says that in the ancient world, when one went through that initiation and came out of it, although there were different levels of, of bringing one into the mysteries, but the ultimate initiation was you were referred to as a father and that you had come into a relationship uh, based upon that initiation right of the Father. But see, within the, the, the mysteries of the Father, the, the mysteries, the full mystery of Christ hadn't occurred yet, so that they don't have it all put together to be able to uh, interpret the Gospel of John. And that's an important point. And, and if you disagree with me, that's fine too. Okay, I'm just trying to give you the perspective as presented by Rudolf Steiner. And he says that in the ancient world, the, the uh, normal experience as you go further back and the further back you go, uh, like into the period, for example, uh, before uh, the Greek philosophers and then it's cascaded into what uh, Frederick Nietzsche called the, the birth of tragedy, that there was this, something was being lost, and it was that direct communion with the spiritual world. But yet in the ancient world, uh, important aspects of it were, were rescued by Plato, but then uh, turned into abstractions by Aristotle. So there's this continual interplay between this earthly consciousness and that which is receiving the divine inspiration. But as we move forward, you see that whereas in the ancient world, they had the opinion that thought was something from the realm of the angels and that it was something you participated in. And it's through your participation within the realm of thought that thought took place. and. And that is, or you could say in, in Advaita Vedanta, you would say the, the realm of manas, which would be the realm of wisdom, which would be uh, the spirit self in anthroposophy. But the, the monastic principle right here 
and and that would give you access to a relationship to your existence before you were born. And that was a very common occurrence. In fact, that was the state of affairs in the ancient world that gradually receded. And then finally, when we get to uh, the fourth century, and the kind of the fulcrum point is 333 AD, but you get this point to where they begin to like ostracize the Gnosis, the, the Gnostic the teachings, and, and there were a lot of changes as they turned Christianity from an inspired belief into a legal system that was taken into uh, the system of the Roman Empire. And we're, and we're not saying uh, everything's bad about that. You just have to understand that there are certain modalities uh, of thought. For example, as we pass that fourth century transition, it becomes the state of affairs that in, instead of uh, the Christ event being this spiritual revelation like the experience of Paul, it becomes more of a, a codification of the biography of something that happened years ago. And so it became more of an earthly experience. And that the, the mysteries that were concealed within the grail uh, the the were the these the way it's depicted is that the angels took the grail and lifted it up into the spiritual world so that the kind of the that spiritual understanding of Christianity had had moved away from mankind it was and in the legend it's you know that it's in a, in a stored in an inaccessible place, and you got to go through this wilderness, and and there's all these ideas of that. There's these challenges that beset one who goes on the journey for the Grail, that's that's described in the ninth century, uh, or about the ninth century by uh, Wolfgang von Eschenbach and and others. And so you see that you have this this cosmic Christianity that is represented by the grail that, that goes into the background. And you have the codification of Christianity in a legal system uh, with principles based on a historical biography. And the important thing is that whole history. Um, and then you say, well, you know, what happened? And Rudolf Steiner talks that, that the, the realm of thought was, was uh, before that time in the domain of the exousiae, of the spirits of form, of which Jehovah Elohim of the Old Testament is a uh, leading representative, right? The, and so in understanding how that went into a transition, we have it trans, transforming into thinking, enters into the realm of the archai, which is three stages beyond mankind, just above the archangels. So that it, it's, coming closer and, and the realm of the archive, that's the realm of the ego, that the ego was basically created out of the substance of the realm of the archive by the logos, by, by Christ. And that that's the ocean of, of ego, of I-ness, the I am, the I am that was behind the inspirations that were coming to Moses through the burning bush, that the, the Christ was the being working with Jehovah Elohim and coming before him as, as a column of smoke and a, a column of fire at night and all of that. But it was something in nature. See, it was outside this guiding force. Whereas in the ancient mysteries, were you to come into relationship with this logos, you'd have to go into a trance and leave your body and have an experience in the realm of the supersensible. So there are these two modalities available to one if you, if you simplify it. But as we get into uh, the fourth century, they start uh, 
pr making pronouncements against the Gnosis as heresy and all of these things that happened. And, and you get into uh, the experience of uh, John Scotus Saragina, who is, is such a, a key figure in trying to get into understanding uh, some of the principles that are involved. I have an important reference hidden here somewhere. I, uh, yeah, I think it's down here. No? Excuse me, but uh, some things are necessary. There it is. That, that would lead even your friend Bertrand Russell, uh, who referred to John Scotus Aragina as the most astonishing person of the ninth century. And so uh, that could be like a little prelude into what I'd like to talk about today. David? Yeah, I mean, people shouldn't take the public persona of Bertie at face value. Um, if ever there was a complicated individual, it's Bertrand Russell. Um, and as I say, you know, I mean, what was that book of his, Why Not a Christian? Um, that must be balanced against the fact, of course, he's from Quaker origins and was actually married or, I mean, it's not quite that simple in Quaker circles. Um, he, he had a, a, a ceremony with his life partner actually in a friend's meeting house. Uh, and I, as I said before, I think, when I was very, 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 very young and he was very, 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 very old, I asked him, uh, you know, <laughs> Is there any, any point to you in becoming a Christian? And he said to me, yes, I can see why someone would be a Quaker. So, you know, one must be very careful about what, what people assume others are saying. I mean, I also remember uh, reading uh, that Wittgenstein spent an afternoon with Bertie, with Bertie going on and on about sort of his liberal capitalist approach and Wittgenstein replying he'd rather be bayoneted to death than start thinking like Bertrand Russell. And you can't help feeling he's on the right lines there. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, I mean, where, where, oh gosh, where do I start with it? Um, yeah, it's because of the Bertrand Russell thing. I think his history of philosophy is an astonishing work. <clears throat> Didn't he get two Nobel Prizes? I seem to remember something along those lines. And he could be wrong. I mean, anyone who thinks, anyone who writes letters to Che Guevara assuming that someone like that actually stands for positive revolution, has dropped the ball. Um, if anyone knows anything about Che Guevara, a nasty homophobic nationalist, if ever there was. Um, so, no, we've all got to... And you ought to hear what people in that part of the world say about him. I'm letting him off the hook. Um, so, yeah, you've got to be careful, you know, public persona, private reality, public persona, private reality. Um, it links in curiously to conversations I had not too long ago about uh, remembrances of Bertrand Russell. It was Bertie. Everyone called him Bertie. Um, it, which made me think one day I need to write an, an autobiography. I'm toying with two titles at the minute. I might call it Mr. Wonderful or, or I might call it Hey, Good Looking. Um, uh, as you, uh, why am I saying those things? Because Stephen Sondheim, what what is my boat rocked by this week? Stephen Sondheim passed into glory. Why am I a short fat cleric and not the uh, not the author of West Side Story, which strikes me as much more wonderful um, than being being a short fat cleric? Um, although being a short fat cleric is wonderful in its own way, but oh my God, the lyrics. Those songs, and I hear Spielberg's remade it or something. You know, a life of music and wonder and all of his colleagues giving him a round of applause at the end of his life. I hate him. I hate him. I'd love to, love to have a career like Stephen Sondheim. I hate him. Um, I am making a little levity, not only because I'm freezing, but because I sense you wanting to talk about Christology, which is a subject... I assiduously circumnavigate um, for the simple reason, uh, it, you know, what is my trouble with most churches? I mean, many people may have noticed my struggle with various denominations. I've not kept it quiet. I mean, I wanted everyone to see as far as they could 
what was going on. And I think I'm going to write about a section of that in my, my new book, my forthcoming book. You know, what was going on there? Um, and why are they so difficult to navigate? Because in every single church, in every single denomination, everybody's rowing about everything. So that's why I try and keep clear of Christology. Um, not only because there are practical reasons, like, all right, well, you know, how many years has anybody got on this earth to, to enter into that type of argument, which to me at the end of the day is rather fatuous. So you've got an opinion, I've got an opinion, hurrah. Oh, I'm sorry, you want your opinion to be my opinion. Who, you know, boo-hoo. Um, I always assumed with the Christian mystics that, that Christology was more to do with personal meditation and mysticism. Um, certainly, yes. I think it's with respect to simplification to think that um, either the Druids, who, of course, converted to Catholicism, it forced or not, they converted to Catholicism. And the, the child, the metaphysical child of that conversion, which would have been Celtic Christianity, was either somehow lesser than Latin Christianity, which is how it's being presented in some quarters at the minute. You know, you've got the wild, rustic, imaginative, intuitive, who's something to do with the Celts and says he's a Christian, compared to the well-educated Roman who knows how how to write nasty letters in Latin to various people. I mean, there is a certain truth in that, but there's a certain untruth in that. Um, as Christianity, my own opinion is uh, the worst thing Christians ever did was <laughs> say we want to become the state religion of anywhere. That's the worst thing. Um, I can see why people said it, and I can see pro possibly the reasons why that, that drear process went forward. Um, However, I do think most people have got it wrong when they think one assumed power at the expense of the other. Um, those clerics of a more, a more worldly disposition who decided to get into theocracies, power, decision-making, politics, and the rest of it certainly took uh, op an open precedence over the others. But uh, the attitude to me seems to have been, you lot want to be mystic, okay, get on with it. You know, go and be mystical. We want to talk about money and power. Um, so that seems to be my own humble reading of that. And Christology, until very mm. recently, of course, was a part of the latter. It was a part of the uh, the, the Celtic approach, for want of a better word. Um, if you want to be mystical, do it in privacy, Father. Um, <laughs> don't, don't drag us into it. And the minute you go down that route, uh, you tend to see what I would see in terms of Christology, mystery after mystery after mystery. You know, is it an either or? I mean, are the various models of Christology meant to be this rational debate where great minds engage like rutting rhinos to, to battle it out until one's flat on his back? That doesn't strike me like Christianity. And it doesn't strike me like anything becoming of the Christian mystery itself. Um, surely all of these views are necessary in themselves to even scratch the surface of what something like an incarnation could possibly mean. Um, I like personally the stories in the Middle East. I've heard them time and time again. I'm sure you have, John. Of the, you know, the substitution theory. I, I like the stories. I think they're getting at something but I'm not sure what, I'm not saying I believe in them. I think there's a way, you know, that you've got Mr. Gogs trying to explain a mystery. One has to remember that the initiates of the ancient world and the plain mysteries of the Bible, which are in, which are in open sight, actually were explained by various people in that part of the world called Mr. Gogs. You joined a mystery school, the Mr. Gog, the head of the mystery school, when you reached a, t a certain level of prayer and meditation, would actually explain to you what they meant by that. So that, you know, the, the three who are one actually would have had an explanation at one point. Maybe there are still people out there claiming claiming to be in that line. Um, certainly the Gnostics claim to be the mystagogues of Christianity as a whole. Um, and the trouble with that, I think, is that various factions of the worldly side of the church some wanted to back that as a subterfuge to hide their own dodgy dealings, 
whereas others just wanted to, to get rid of the whole thing for their own various reasons. Um, you know, what Christianity may have done to a certain extent is remove the explanations that it needs to actually present itself on a logical, coherent level, as well as a mystical level. But I, I you know, I, I can't help feeling that these things are private, personal matters. It's something where you go into your closet and pray. As a, And I know everyone will disagree with me, you know. And if I think of the present field of Christology, where everybody's literally got a beef about something. I mean, what was the, I can't remember which feminist theologist uh wrote that what was it the gospels was it tillman i can't remember was it elizabeth stewart i can't remember that basically the gospels are a form of cosmic child abuse i mean you know he just he just goes on and on and on and you can't say she's completely wrong i mean that's the point if you start looking at it from that perspective uh you get that i mean also the way the christ principle energy power presence is portrayed in scriptures themselves you get so many different views of what it he she is um therefore i suspect although i could give academ ac academized answers to what various people think christology means and where it's going i, I would be loath to take sides because for me, it's rather a journey, a personal journey, a spiritual journey into a mystery. And I think anybody that wants to argue to the death in a university department about, about feminist or queer theology, why didn't I become a queer theologist? They're all rich and powerful now. Why did I hold out? Do you know, I'll tell everybody what I said. I knew half of that lot when, I, when it started. And I said, oh, nonsense. There's only good theology and there's bad theology. I don't know what you're talking about. And shame on me. I now have a massive bank account and a house of my own and collect cars like some of them if I'd have given in and written that sort of stuff as well. Um, what they did that was good, because it's not all bad, some of it's very, very insightful indeed. What they did that was good was reopen the fact that people don't know what the Christ presence is, and there's an ongoing debate. You know, and it links back to what I was saying earlier. Um, most of the divisions in Christianity between so-called divisions, between Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, Assyrians, um, tend to be boiled down at the end of the day to what the how we see the Christ figure. And I, I don't know, as I get older, I get increasingly less partisan i suppose um you know it's kierkegaard that line has been on my mind all week as well you know christianity isn't about salvation according to kierkegaard as a discussion because even the even the pagans used to talk about that christianity is the awareness of sin as a sickness unto death as something wrong as something wrong in the way we deal with ourselves we deal with other people as some sort of inherited flaw whereby we don't always reach to our best. We don't always look for the good. We don't always try to, to allow our faith to ascend to a higher level. I mean, sometimes we're our own worst enemies in Christianity. So I suppose as much, yeah, I'm willing to discuss Christology with you on, on the proviso that everybody, including your good self, is fully aware that I largely think these gladiatorial encounters um, a pointless. I'll give you one last example for I, for I hand back. Um, one of my tutors at King's was Keith Ward. I'll say nothing else. Um, Professor Ward had been a church of uh, C of E vicar, an Anglican vicar. Um, when I was at King's, he was on his way to being something or other at Oxbridge. Um, he had, I thought at that time, some sort of Hegelian view of it all. Um, I'm not so sure now, but I think that's what maybe what he was saying at that time, who had a public debate with Donald Cupid. Um, I think it was in the Explorers Club, the, club, the Continental Club. Uh, Donald Cupid was, of course, um, also an Anglican priest, an Anglican vicar, who wrote a book uh, called The Sea of Faith, which became a TV series. I actually thought quite a remarkable series where you end up none the wiser about anything but it's all something to do with your community 
<coughs> and these two had a, a, a gladiatorial match which went on for about an hour and a half. Give it a rest. After an hour, people want tea. They want refreshments. They don't want to listen to you, to old goats, going on and on and on about something you clearly have never experienced. Um, Keith scored most logical points. Apparently, that's a sign that you've won. Bertrand Russell would have hated that. I could have told everyone in the room. He'd have absolutely hated that attitude. Um, but you couldn't help thinking, I couldn't help thinking, along with most other people in the room, that actually Donald Cupid had won. You know, Keith had scored all these points and all of them were irrefutable, but Donald Cupid had won. Why? Because it was all something to do with doing the right thing and being human and realising our failings and not being a pain in the ass and trying to make it relevant to our own lives nowadays. Um, certainly, I think it's wise to be cautious of abstract thinking. I don't think it should be uh, thrown out like the baby with the bathwater. But you can't help feeling the Don Cupid's of the world, the people that want to give testimonies, the people that want to say, I've got a personal relationship with Christ, and this is what it means. Don't forget, that's even a part of Catholic experience. There are Catholic charismatics. Um, I don't think that should be dismissed too easily or too readily, um, no matter how preposterous some of it seems to get sometimes, because these people are talking about something very real and very meaningful, and a lot of the time actually quite beautiful compared to a series of dogmatic statements or evolutionary, you know, academized statements that actually lead people nowhere in particular. I'll hand back, John. I don't know what you think of that bit. Well, somebody's got their own uh, conference going on over here, and uh, Robert is uh, trying to take us down the corridors of uh, the door that opened with Bertrand Russell and and so there is that the how far can you go with the abstract thinking of the realm of the senses and but yet when you when you get into that and some of the deepest uh, people as far as their evaluation amongst their peers uh, where you'd have like Wittgenstein for example he was able to to like uh, become friends with Bertrand Russell and, and and deconstruct his view of the world, and in Alfred North Whitehead, his basic uh, foundational premises are based upon crib notes from one of Wittgenstein's lectures. And what is Wittgenstein toward the end of his life? He's uh, attempting to 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 get to the point. To there's uh, the, the Christ in me is the dominant theme in his life. So it, what, it, perhaps uh, considered by many to be the greatest philosophical light of the 20th century, and that's what he came to. And, and you go down, you can go down the list. I mean, you go like, for example, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, you know, although he was a hip Cisterian and he had nothing but the highest respect for anybody from any tradition. He, he was his own version of Christianity himself, you know, but how Faustian, Faust means fist, you know, by the way. And Faustus was uh, the contender with, with Augustine, right? That was the big uh, argument over uh, the Monarchian stream that, that uh, Augustine was part of. And, and so the Monarchian kind of embodies that whole Gnostic tradition of which I referred to that was went into a twilight in the fourth century. And he, so you say, well, what is that? Why? Well, in light of what Rudolf Steiner says, and by the way, it's not uh, so much doctrinal uh, in that if you look at the Bible, you just have to, in the New Testament especially, you have to say, what is it? It's a mirror. And so you're going to get out of it what you're capable. It's, that's 
to me, the simplest explanation to, to many of these different congregations. And I say, okay, fine, go do that. You know, that's, that's what you're working on right now. But as one enters into these things uh, in the light of spiritual science, you start to see that, that the newness that was able to come into being through what we would call the grail tradition. It was because Parseval was so pristine. He, he was unaffected by all this discrepancies and, and, and disagreements and all of that within the realm of theology. He didn't know any of that stuff, according to the accounts given. He was a pure fool, right? He's like, we're all the pure fool, you know, and you don't know. And, and, yet, and furthermore, you don't know you don't know. And so you think that whatever view you have of the world, that you've got the latest version. And, and so that's all well and good. And there are certain levels that, that are to be very highly regarded. And they have, of course, their context. And I'm not being condescending. I'm just trying to show it, that, that uh, if you approach it from Rudolf Steiner, he says that in the time before Christ, because Christ hadn't come here, they couldn't have a specific relationship uh, to the mystery of Christ in the same way. And he says that there were initiates at the time of Christ when he was alive, and they could they could tell if somebody was an initiate of the Father Mysteries. They could look at somebody, and they could tell just from their aura, uh, you know, who this person was, right? That they were clairvoyant. And when Jesus of Nazareth came along, especially after the crucifixion, that is the key when when the dove descended and the spirit of Christ entered into him. Rudolf Steiner says that they could see that there was a different radiance that he had from all the others because they, you know, they see each other, they encounter each other, and there's a certain radiance that somebody has in their aura that had to do with being able to enter into the mysteries of the Father. And so here comes along the Christ mystery, and and what has happened, though, is that the Christ mystery is such that the key is to understand the Trinity, because when the dove descends, that's giving one a hint. That's that, that principle of the Holy Spirit, and that really, if Christ would have come in and fully expressed himself, we wouldn't be free beings. Right, I mean that that if if it was just it wouldn't be us being good, it'd be Christ acting through us being good, which is not what he, according to Rudolf Steiner, was attempting to develop. Because the goal of Earth evolution is to develop the spirits of freedom and love, meaning us accomplishing the development potential that is laid out for us. And so he says that so the the Christ principle works in us unconsciously and that we have the freedom to be able to approach the spirit even through uh, abstract thinking. You could take this book, The Philosophy of Freedom, if you have no inclination whatsoever to any religions, you could just read that book and there's nothing religious about it, but it will bring you into a relationship with the spiritual world. So that there's not one path up the mountain. There's, there's many different paths. But through the idea that you can approach it through thinking, that's the principle of wisdom, and that's the Holy Spirit. And that's the key, that, that we begin our journey in, in coming into that whole idea of developing a relationship to the Holy Spirit, which in the East they would call manas, and is is the fifth principle. Now, if we go uh, and get an example, uh, you get the Count uh, Cagliostro, and there's an interesting quote that, that was uh, in one of the works of Julius Evola of, of the, com uh, the Comdi Cagliostro, 
and the Count Cagliostro, he says, I belong neither to any century nor to any particular place. My spiritual being lives its eternal existence outside time and space. When I immerse myself in thought, I go back through the ages. When I extend my spirit to a world existing far from any thing you perceive, I can change myself into whatever I wish, participating consciously in absolute being. I regulate my action according to my surroundings. My country is wherever I happen to set foot at the moment. I am that which is, free and master of life. There are beings who no longer possess guardian angels. I am one of those. So you have to look at that. And the average individual doesn't have really have a context for what he just said. But there are, I'm sure, somewhere in our audience, people that have a background in hermeticism and and the esoteric traditions to know that, that what he's talking about is, is uh, the understanding of uh, the fifth principle. And further on, I want to I want to share uh, just a, a little bit uh, what Rudolf Steiner has said about Cagliostro. Uh, first of all, it's to be borne in mind that the whole of the Masonic higher degrees trace back to a personality often spoken about, but equally very much misunderstood. He was particularly misunderstood by 19th century historians who have no idea of the difficult situations an occultist can meet in life. This personality is the ill-famed and little understood Cagliostro, the so-called Count Cagliostro, in whom an individuality concealed itself, which was recognized in its true nature only by the highest initiates. Attempted originally to bring Freemasonry in London to a higher stage. For during the last third of the 18th century, Freemasonry had fairly well reached the state that I have described. He did not succeed in London at the time, he then tried in Russia and also at The Hague. Elsewhere, he was unsuccessful for very definite reasons. Then, however, he was successful in Lyon, in France, forming an occult Masonic lodge of the Philalethes, the searchers after truth, out of a group of local Masons, which was called the Lodge of Triumphing Wisdom. The purpose of this lodge was specified Cagliostro, what you can read about it is, however, nothing but the work of ignorant people. What can be said about it is only an indication. Cagliostro was concerned with two things. Firstly, with the instructions enabling one to produce the so-called philosopher's stone. Secondly, with creating an understanding of the mystic pentagram. I can only give you a hint of the meaning of these two things. They may be treated with a deal of scorn, but they are not to be taken merely symbolically. They are based on real facts. And he gets into talking about the Philosopher's Stone. And, and uh, well, I guess I should just continue because it's quite fascinating what he says. He says the Philosopher's Stone is a specific purpose, which was stated by Cagliostro. It is meant to prolong human life to a span of 5,520 years, 27 years. 5,527 years. To a free thinker, that appears laughable. In fact, however, it is possible by means of special training to prolong life indefinitely by learning to live outside the physical body. Anyone, however, who has imagined that no death in the conventional sense of the word could strike down an adept would have quite a false view of the matter. So whoever imagined that an adept could not be hit by a falling roof slate would also be wrong. To be sure, that would usually only occur if the adept allowed it. We are not dealing here with physical death, but with the following. Physical death is only an apparent occurrence for him who has understood the Philosopher's Stone for himself and has learned to separate it. For other people, it is a real happening which signifies a great division in their life. For he who understands how to use the Philosopher's Stone in the way that Cagliostro intended his pupils to do, death is only an apparent occurrence. 
It does not even constitute a decisive turning point in life. It is in fact something which is only there for the others who can observe the adept and say he is dying. He himself, however, does not really die. It is much more the case that the person concerned has learned to live without his physical body. And that he has learned during the course of life to let all those things take place in him gradually, which happens suddenly in the physical body at the moment of death. Everything has already taken place in the body of the person concerned, which otherwise takes place at death. Death is then no longer possible. And he goes on, and I want to get to the next point because that's related to what we're discussing. He said there was two points, right? And so I continue. The second lesson was the knowledge of the pentagram. That is the ability to be able to distinguish the five bodies of man one from the another. When someone says physical body, etheric body, astral body, kama manas body, causal body, which is the higher manas or spirit self, these are mere words or at best abstract ideas. Nothing, however, is achieved by that. A person living today as a rule hardly knows the physical body. Only one who knows the pentagram learns to know the five bodies. One does not know a body by living in it, but by having it as an object. This is what distinguishes an average person from one who's gone through such schooling that the five bodies have become objects. So that's quite a long quote, but uh, that is something that was achieved by some Rosicrucians. And, and that's that whole idea of being able to get to that, the fifth principle, which is the fourth principle is the human ego. The fifth principle is the spirit self or manas. And so it's an actually uh, something that pertains to the, the antakarana or the, the building the rainbow bridge, which is one of the questions presented to me is like, what, well, what is, what are they referring to in these when they say antakarana? Well, it, it, it's variously translated as instrument, uh, but it's a vehicle that that is connecting the the lower quaternary to the higher triad. So your lower quaternary is your your uh, physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego is the fourth principle. And the fifth principle is the manas or spirit self or the Holy Spirit in the in the Christian tradition, so that you can learn to think like an angel because it thinks in you. You become a, an exponent of the, the expression of the spiritual world. And so that's that mystery that, that uh, Cagliostro was attempting to deal with. I realize that's a lot of difficult material, but I like to give people challenging things to think about. You, you forget, sir, that my, my publisher is trying to present me as the new Montague Summers. Uh, I hope she doesn't succeed. <laughs> um, um, no, I, I, I think I've let it out from time to time. I'm, I've got a certain knowledge of occultism. Um, I take it very... It's very real and it's very powerful, and I take it very seriously indeed. Um, I mean, Cagliostro, I mean, one has to balance against those remarkable words the fact that sometimes in certain of his rituals, certain of his ceremonies, he used to come down from the ceiling stark naked on a golden ball and try and shock people to death. So one has to bear in mind the showmanship that also went along with that. Um, I always had him down as a totally ruthless bastard, to be honest, as opposed to to a saintly adept, I, I maybe I've read the wrong people on Cagliostro, but I don't warm to the personality at all. Um, if anybody's willing to sacrifice their grandparents for a, a further scrap of knowledge, I am not necessarily on the same wavelength as that person. I mean, are initiations and initi uh, initiatic experiences mentioned in the Bible very clearly? I mean, you know, because there are many levels to the Bible. Certainly the whole scenario with Lazarus, you know, Lazarus come you forth. I mean, anybody that knows anything about the occultism and the mysteries of the Near East, the Eastern world, <clears throat> maybe particularly at that time, 
will recognize an adept working with a student, uh, the student going into, and I'm not saying there aren't other ways of meditating on this, there are. What the, what the adept used to do was put the student into a mystical trance, as I'm sure you know, and their, their spirit would leave their body and roam to the, realm, the realms of light, the realms of wisdom, and then be summoned back by the adept. Uh, the difference in that particular story is meant to be that Lazarus had actually died, so no adept could summon him back, and it wasn't simply a trance. And uh, Jesus showed his power to those around him, as well as the mystery schools, by still managing to summon back the spirit of the person who'd gone to those realms and therefore knew de facto more than others. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm also aware that certain of the, uh, of the Gnostic schools, I mean, that their theologies get very complex. Uh, Valentinus himself gets very complex. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the dove showing the Holy Spirit actually entering into the Master Jesus, the Adept Jesus at that particular time because it's a ceremony of initiation. I mean, my answer to all of that is yes and no. Um, can one see those things in those stories? Of course, those stories were written down to show that Christians knew about those things as well. And dare I suggest the, the authors are saying Christians had done better at them than everybody else. Um, that they'd done them really in a, the most real and existential way as compared to the others who were either tinkering or there was a sort of ceiling beyond which they couldn't go. <clears throat> now, whether that's fair to Christianity or the occult traditions of the Middle East, I, I wouldn't like to say, but that was certainly the impression that, that some of the Christian writers and authorities wanted to give. Um, I Again, that's dragging us back to the, the realms of Christology, which I'm, I'm loath to do. I'm very sympathetic to that view um, because it must mean something. You know, the fact that the career of our saviour takes a whole different turn after that encounter with John the Baptist must be taken as a turning point for everybody involved uh, and on a number of levels. So one has to bear that in mind. Um, oh, you're beginning to talk about occultism. I've got to be careful. I mean, I've known various occultists in this city uh, since I moved here. Um, this city has tends to have more people dabbling with the dark, uh, most of which don't know that, most of which don't know that than people pursuing the light. And one hears in various pub meetings in this city, everything's based around a pub meeting. Uh, people making the most horrendously egoic statements and then feeling somehow justified in that. And that was somehow the superiority of the Vama Marg, the left-hand path, as opposed to us mere incompetence trying to walk along the path of light. And that really is how it was presented. That is getting worse um, as the years go on. I'm not sure why things have taken a rather darker turn over the last couple of years, um, where now it's just ridiculous talking about such mysteries. You know, what has the light got to show us? Look at what the church has done. Yeah, you've got a point. But again, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. What have you people done? I mean, you know, the, the, the gas chambers of Auschwitz, you know, the endless killings of Stalin or, or Mao Zedong. I mean, let's look at what you lot have done, um, which, again, is rather like the medical profession or the scientists in general. The occultists themselves are a house divided and don't really want to talk about what's going on. I mean, they'll go to the level of, you know, every symbol is a symbol of something. It's not just a symbol. It actually points towards something. They'll, they'll do that, but beyond that, they start getting, becoming either New Age wafty candles, and I'm very fond of the New Age, you know, whereby, oh, what do you mean by ethics? You know, what do you mean by good and evil? Well, actually, I've got a lot to say about ethics and a lot to say about good and evil. Um, and they don't want to go any further because it's all self-evident and glamour very soon raises its ugly head and you realise the person you're talking to actually isn't, an initiate of Gnosis, they, they've just got a big ego and very little reading. So you've got to be careful where you go because you very in this city it's easy to come across people 
who have taken the step beyond that. And you've got to be very, 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 very careful when that happens. Um, for me, I mean, I'm a Christian. I don't, I, I take the hypsisterian call to arms incredibly seriously. Um, and we've got to see the noble and good in every tradition, in every philosophy, in every religion. <clears throat> but I don't think uh, on an equal footing, uh, for Christians, Christ is the ultimate transcendent point. Everything else points to it. But there is no alternative to it. Either, you know, my way or, or the highway, that, that is the only way. Um what that means, of course, might be very complicated indeed. Um, I notice in certain Protestant churches nowadays that's, that, that's taken almost like a fait accompli. We knew that at the beginning. We knew that. But they don't know what they knew from the beginning. If you ask them anything, what do you mean by that? They won't be able to go any further. And then all of a sudden, it's uh, you're, you know, you're being sinful if you're questioning them, um, as opposed to you know, reading the scriptures daily and testing yourself, which is also scriptural. Um, yeah, I mean, I certainly don't mind our discussions going into occultism. These are endlessly deep and fascinating areas. Um, as long as we're careful with the authors in question, I mean, even Montague Summers, I mean, what a, it was a rather tongue in cheek comment that my, although I'm sure she would like that, you know, I mean, um, a, a man who was an old Catholic. Was he ordained? Yes. Was he a Roman Catholic? No. What was he? An old Catholic. Um, is that valid? Yes. And there are all sorts of arguments, yada, 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 yada. Um, and his way of presenting his rather antique view of what Catholicism was. I mean, any any man that, that actually approves of the Malaeus Modificarum, uh, that... that <laughs> is not necessarily a good man. Um, anyone that wants to see people tortured for the good of the gospel may not have understood the gospel. And any, you know, anyone that goes, you know, are werewolves everywhere. I love those books. I don't care what they say about his writing style. They're beautifully written. You know, are there werewolves everywhere? Are there vampires everywhere? I don't know. Um, but, you know, if you get me reading his book, you'd think they're all living up the road or something and just about to pounce on you. Certainly occultism is 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 wonderful, a wonderfully deep subject. I just hope we can keep to those balanced territories whereby representatives of the light uh, are given full, full pelt as well as rather piebald characters like Cagliostro did he live for 5,000 years? Is he still alive? I don't know. And if I ever get to meet him and he's still alive, I would ask him if he's accepted Jesus Christ into his life as a personal Lord and Saviour. And if he hasn't, then for me, it doesn't matter if he lives another 3,000 years more. Uh, live as long as you want to. You've misunderstood the whole point of human history. Handing back to you, John. <laughs> That was great, and and it gives me a context to try and explicate some of the challenges that are in your postulations. Even though you're trying to trying to depostulate our conversation, nonetheless, there are certain things that you can postulate. And if, for example, the conversion of uh, uh, that happened of Paul. I mean, it wasn't anything that he had chosen. He, I mean, he was running around trying to round up Christians, and all of a sudden he's confronted with the Christ appearing to him within the supersensible. So we're, we're looking at something, and, and going back to C.S. Lewis, his him, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, saying to him, well, it's either true or it's not regarding scripture. And that was, for whatever reason, that was the, the feather that, that turned the anvil. And so from that point, uh, C.S. Lewis, 
from being an agnostic had become perhaps the greatest exponent of, of Christianity within the public notice in the 20th century in, in uh, Britain. And so, because if you get into that, and, and the, again, we've so many times said, and I will repeat it again and again, because it's it goes back to Hegel saying that the Bible's there no matter what your level is. And if you look, uh, all the deepest people concern themselves with it, you know? And so it's definitely worthy of consideration. But if you get into the esoteric viewpoint uh, and you get into the teachings of John, including the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse, Ritter Steiner makes a very startling point. And he says that, uh, uh, but you have to be able to draw from, from numerous sources within his body of work, which is over 6,700 lectures and 50 articles of books and all of that. But basically what he says, that the earth is the fourth state of consciousness. It's preceded by three stages and will be followed by three stages. And our development within this particular stage of consciousness is that of waking consciousness. And we are preceded by Saturn, Sun, Moon, which is trans consciousness, a deep dreamless sleep, and then the sleep dream consciousness of old moon. And so well, what does that mean? Well, in, in getting to, to try and understand what we're doing here, Rudolf Steiner says, and it's very specific, he says that uh, we are already in the New Jerusalem. And, and if you're not participating within uh, the kingdom of the New Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world, that's due to your own measure of consciousness. And that's what Cagliostro is talking about, because it's that that whole procession towards the mystery of the resurrection, you see. And, and Cagliostro is difficult to talk about, and perhaps that's why I picked him, because he's been attacked so many times, even by Goethe, you know? And so uh, you also can go, uh, Thomas Carlyle attacked him. Uh, you know, all, all manner of people have taken their jabs at this, this ill-understood uh, initiate. And that's well and good. But the principles addressed in that particular paragraph that were uh, regarding the, the whole idea of that there are, he says there are those people who no longer have a guardian angel. I am one of those. And that's basically tantamount to saying that he's accomplished the fifth stage, which is that that idea of the spirit self of, of manas that he he is has opened the two petal lotus of the brow chakra which is really the connection point of the hu of the ego of mankind is at that point so that's that's the first stage whether or not he went beyond that well obviously according to the indications of Rudolf steiner that the idea is that that's just what he was trying to get to his students but that he had already gone beyond that. And so you have these mysteries in uh, great initiates being able to materialize or dematerialize at will and uh, appear to people at distant locations. I mean, go, even going back to last week, uh, one of the qualifications uh, that's, that's mentioned uh, and it's been verified by... Uh, experience of researchers in the shaman tradition of the Tungu that, you know, they can be visited in, in an astral form by uh, a relation of theirs and told to, to go meet at, at such and such place and they'll show up there. Well, how did they know that? How did they, you know, you're talking about a place 50 miles away and there's no telephones and, and they, they have these meetings. Yeah. And so, or you go back to what happened to Stylianos Ateslis, Daskalos, on the Isle of Cyprus when he was, he was asked by Charles Leadbeater if he 
would he be the the uh, incarnation? The, the which is like the one of the themes that, that led Rudolf Steiner to leave the Theosophical Society because there can be no no uh, reincarnation of the Christ that the Christ is already here. Uh, he did that to be able to uh, save us from ourselves, basically. And but that Charles Ledbetter had asked Daskalos when sixteen or seventeen years old, he was trying to get him to be the world teacher, and and Rudolf Steiner appeared to uh, Daskalos and told him not to do it. And uh, I don't know a whole lot of people that can just do something like that. And so that the, there's a there's a reality. There's so many phonies. There's got to be a real one somewhere. And so uh, I have a tendency, obviously, because of the work that I've done and the books that I've written, that that's my background, that I, I found just based on the internal consistency of his body of work, uh, nobody could have made all that up. It's, it's not humanly possible. Therefore, uh, it's worth looking into at the very least. And so I'll just leave it at that. But so in getting into understanding these things, you got to realize that, that Rudolf Steiner very specifically says that we're already in the New Jerusalem, that the New Jerusalem was established through the resurrection. And it's, it's up to us to, to develop ourselves to the point to where we've developed the spiritual consciousness so that we begin participating with the divine spiritual beings, drawing our inspiration from the angels, the archangels, and the archai, the Holy Spirit, the Christ Logos, and the Father, the force that moves the blood, which of course is why they want to gain access to your blood in the first place. They want to derail that whole process. So th these mysteries where you have the mystery of the bread and wine, the bread has to do with the cosmos and the wine has to do with the individual ego. And, and it's that interaction, this is my body and this is my blood. He's telling you he's totally there with you. That And in, in the gospel of St. John, you are told that, that there was nothing created that wasn't created by him. And so we're already there. He's already taken the journey for us. He's already created the archetype. And so it's up to us to freely choose to enter into the life of the spirit. Because were he to enter fully into our being, again, like I said, it would be Christ acting in us, not us. So he would like us to become spirits of freedom and love. And so the, it's that mystery. So you say, well, according to the Christian dispensation, what is the Antis Karana? Well, within Christianity, you would say, what is that bridge? What is the rainbow bridge? It's love. That you have wisdom and will, the two pillars. So the, the will aspect is like the Old Testament, Jehovah, and he appears in the burning bush. And the wisdom aspect is that ancient mysteries, initiation, being taken in trance outside of your body. But what is that principle that brings it all together? It's the principle of love. And so that's the rainbow bridge, is if you can bring, uh, it's not just imagination, inspiration, and intuition. It's moral imagination, moral inspiration, and moral intuition that is is the key to understanding and unlocking these mysteries and, and to still be able to maintain your freedom because you can approach it through the Holy Spirit and that you can be a hypsisterian. You can you're free to, to do it any way any way you want instead of him coming down and I'm the king of this world and if you don't follow me I'll chop your head off. That's not where he's coming from. But you see, this whole idea of the overly material interpretation led to the Crusades, for example. The Crusaders were trying to find the kingdom on earth, but the kingdom is not of this world. But everything about what they did isn't bad. It's a part of the evolution of consciousness. And so 
we have to be able to be non-judgmental and enter into the darkness with mildness, as, as Mane says, the great initiate Mane. And with that being said, I think it'd be a good point at which to share with our friends out there some of the wonderful contributions by Reverend David and his literary body of work, his book, The Grammar of Witchcraft. And as I always tend to say, it's, it's not a grimoire, it's not a how-to book on witchcraft, it's a Shakespearean study. And very beautifully written. And uh, likewise with his Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption. David has a marvelous grasp of the English language. I'm jealous. And uh, I'm only capable of being pretty clear at times. Uh, he's quite eloquent. And his major work, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, edited, edited by the very talented Daniela Irandust. And all three of these books are available on Amazon, and uh, I highly recommend them. And I also have a couple of books that I have written. And I keep pulling out this faded copy, but I guess that's the way these things go. Here's my first book of 640 pages, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, The Underground Streams, of Esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. It has a forward by Douglas Gabriel, my good buddy over at American Intelligence Media. It has, it's loaded with diagrams and bibliography, and the whole series of diagrams is reproduced also in my second book, which is The Arcana of Light on the Path. And it's the series of what are grail diagrams, and you have the, uh, go through it a little slower. People, you could stop the video and perhaps encapsulate something. But I added a whole bunch of diagrams in addition to the diagrams in Arcana of the Grail Angel. My books are available in the Continental US on eBay. Uh, if you're outside the US, you can contact me directly through my academia website listed below or through private message on Facebook. Also, if you'd like to uh, provide us with cups of coffee for our efforts uh, for Reverend David's paypal.me forward slash D Perry 777. And for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And also at John Barnwell 888, you can go to my uh, Twitter page. I, I don't, but the only thing I've posted there now is my videos, but I have the crown gate thread posted at the top and so you can study the history of the, the workings of the cabal in the West. If that is a subject that interests you, I give links to primary documents and a lot of the work that's been done uh, at American Intelligence Media and Americans for Innovation, my good friends and cohorts, cohorts, and so that's a good thing. And, and I especially want to, to mention uh, my sponsorship by uh, Tyla and Vadim that have been so uh, generous with me and, and so many others that they're listed below. Uh, it's enabled me to continue on with this investigation into the investigation, what is truth? And, and that to me, there's no more important quest. What is truth? Well, for me, if I was going to pick a one word answer, I would say, what is truth? I would have to say love. You caught me that time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, God is love. God is love. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know why you've got me thinking about Wittgenstein again. Um, Certainly, I mean, he used to horrify his students towards the end of his life by saying, each day I must become less and Christ must become more, which, of course, is a scriptural quote. Um, 
I, I think I can't imagine a more beautiful statement than that. Um, in many ways, a deeply misunderstood man to this day. And yeah, I probably go along with those that think he's actually the greatest philosopher of that particular period. Bertie, you were good, but let's face it, Ludwig is better. Um, so, you know, because you get one entire theory of language, then you get another entire theory of language. I, I don't think many people could do that. Um, in terms of this show, I mean, I don't know why more people aren't realizing the great treasure that it is. I mean, this is spiritual science in action. Uh, this is anthroposophy. These discussions have that base. They have that thrust. And I think that's incredibly important. Anthroposophy, to my mind, and you know much better than me on this, isn't a narrow thing. It's actually a very wide thing. And this show, in many ways, is a cutting edge event for spiritual science. I think it's incredibly important. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how long I've got because we're getting very close to, the, to, to running out. I hand back to you, John, because that's right. Um, do you want me to just go naturally into the prayer or do you want to say something else? So I'll hand back to you for a second because I've only just noticed the time. That's because we're in a timeless realm. Perhaps you're there already and you just don't know it. Yes, I think that uh, we're getting to that time. And I just to, to cap it off, I'll just remind people certain points that I have made in previous uh, podcasts, broadcasts, or whatever you want to call it, our little, our little show, our little humble effort here, and is that the, in dealing with that transition that happened at the fourth century uh, A.D. to where we entered more deeply into material consciousness, that and you have that whole idea of uh, say Thomas Aquinas taking Aristotle's abstract and taking it to the nth degree and, and giving modalities of thought of which all the people of which we've named after him are utilizing what he did, whether or not one understands language. But uh, so that Wittgenstein's was using the tools that were basically uh, to a large measure and the largest measure created by St. Thomas Aquinas to be able to investigate, well, what is language and, and what does it mean? What does meaning mean? You know, it's like you could take it so far, but then there becomes the, the level at which it becomes a, an experience. And that is the, the, the real challenge. And so as long as one has one's aspirations in order, if you don't get all the details right, well, that's okay. You know, it's, it's like... Uh, the future unfolds from our mistakes. You know, as, as a, there was a quote to that effect I posted the other day uh, from, from uh, Dr. Levergood. And, and so you have to have this allowance that, that we're all fools, that we're all just experiencing a partiality, that we just have a part of it, but that, that we don't uh, give up on it, that, that we don't let the challenges that were are set upon us knock us from from realizing that at the core of this it's okay because as long as we're we're focused on the mission which is the establishment of the new jerusalem that we've committed ourselves to that whatever happens doesn't matter there's worse things than death and with that i think it'd be great if reverend david uh would be able to lead us in a prayer and consecrate today's efforts. Well, you know me. Two things briefly. Uh, I think you do much more in your work than simply clarify and make clear. I think you're a formidable writer, um, and that needs to be trumpeted a lot more. I mean, th those books are, are remarkable on a number of levels. Um, I just want to say the inklings. I mean, yeah, that was the challenge given to C.S. Lewis, but of course it all came from Kierkegaard uh, and his wonderful book, Either Or, um, either it's true or it's not, um, because clarity isn't just to do with logic. It's also to do with matters of faith, 
And that's what takes time. What is truth? Truth is a process leading towards divination, leading towards divinization, I should say. Um, and that, that takes time, which is why this show not only has a history, but has a future. Uh, these processes can't be rushed. Um, I was going to give a, a, a counting prayer this evening, but I still haven't found the right one. I mean, I found lots of wonderful material, but I haven't found the right one yet for this show at this particular season. So I hope everyone will forgive me yet again for saying the Lord's Prayer. My friends, would you bow your hearts for a moment as we hear the Paternoster? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank everybody for showing up and for anybody who sees it in the rebroadcast greetings or welcome back or whatever applies to it and uh, i hope you all have a beautiful week <laughs>